we didn't sit down and talk about it. I just did it the way I wanted to do it. Nobody ever said do it any way else. For one thing, and this is something that, you know, in terms of archival information, w would probably be you know, somewhat interesting to the people who see this. Generally speaking, if you, if you were, uh, or more than generally speaking, but if you are a regular on a show, the director who comes in and out, you know, on a weekly basis, who generally does not do more than one episode at a time, does not really direct the actors who, who are the, the regulars, the stars. He feels they know their parts, they know their characters, and who am I, who am I only going to be here for a week, to, uh, to give them advice. Plus, they have more power than I do. And that's their thinking, that the actors have more power than I do. So they don't say anything. So nobody ever said anything to me. Uh, they just let me do what I did. Well, did you base him on anyone you knew? No, but what, what, what I did do was I recalled what I had been told in the Neighborhood Playhouse, that, uh, that I had learned that I could be a cocky guy. I could be a, a you know, guy tongue-in-cheek, that I could uh, have fun. And I did not have to be a, 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 a weeping uh, uh, wallflower, you know, that I could, I could be out front and feeling comfortable doing it. And that's what I invested in the character. I mean, not in a, in a great way, because there was never, there was not a lot of time to really develop the character. But what I had to do, that's what I remember. Oh, Russia, it's just outside Leningrad, you know, and just having fun with it. So it was invaluable, it was that, that lesson that I learned at the Playhouse was invaluable in terms of developing the character, what, as I say, what there was of it. So whose idea was it to come up with Chekhov's standard, you know, pride in Mother Russia being vented there? That was theirs, and I thought it was a good idea. Uh, I thought it was a good idea because everybody had something, you know, something you, you, you can get a handle on. Uh, you know, I'm a doctor and not a carrot, or whatever it was that McCoy said. Uh, it's not logical, Captain, you know, uh, Spock would say. But Spock, don't you understand? Now Kirk would say, uh, I don't think I can do that, Captain. We need a four, four or five days for the, you know, Scotty would say. So everybody had something that identified them. And I thought, I thought this would be a, it was kind of a fun thing to do once in a while. But between the second and third seasons, I read a, some deal memos that, Gene had passed with the, with the executives at, at uh, NBC, two guys named Schlosser and Warner, about giving up on this thing about what was invented in Russia because it was sophomoric and because he didn't think it would play to continue doing it. I thought it was a mistake. I mean, not a huge mistake. Chekhov was never big enough to be a huge mistake in anything he did. But I thought it was something that tied the character uh, it, it helped give him an identity. You know, he was very proud of, of, of uh, Mother Russia and um, would always refer to inventions and discoveries as being Russian and, and kind. Now, for example, although it's not the same kind of thing, the, the fact that in Star Trek IV we did this improvised sign, scene where I was asking people in the streets of San Francisco, do you know where the nuclear vessels are? That became as, as much a, uh, a fallback uh, expression as anything. I mean, I've always been asked to repeat that. It's always, always, people always thought that was funny. So those things do, you know, do get into the, into the uh, audience's consciousness and, and become an anchor to help them uh, define and establish and recognize the character. Mostly, it was an expositional character. He was there for, you know, to, to, um, for expository reasons. He, he's the guy that would say, Captain, there's something out there. I don't know what it is. It's big and it's ugly and it has hair on it. What do you think? And then Kirk would say, well, I think. I think it's something we've got, you know, and he'd go and do all the emotional stuff and, and all the internal stuff. And I would just be, the, and I'd be reading the plot stuff. 
you know, and and that's pretty much what George did and what Nichelle did, George Takei and Nichelle Nichols, and even to a good degree what Jimmy Dewan did. We were there to just s set out the bones of the plot and let McCoy, Spock, and Kirk fill it in, you know, with a, with 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 the subjective uh, uh, contribution that they that they brought to it. Did you feel there was any type of specific relationship between Captain Kirk and Chekhov? No, not really. I, I know they were supposed to be. I was supposed to be his. Uh, I was supposed to look up to him and uh, and hope to be captain one day, or or hope to be science officer one day. But it was never really. It was never really dealt with in in the, in the story, and it was so <laughs> difficult to have a uh, to have a warm and understanding relationship with Bill Shatner that. It, 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 I, I didn't feel driven to want to uh, develop something strong. I just, I just let, let, let the, let the, I let the words play out, and just took it moment by moment. Let's talk about the look of Chekhov as well. So when you first started, you talk about the hair piece. You know, why did you need the the wig at first? Well, my hair was very short because I had just shot my own film, and I'd start, it started to thin a little bit. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a lot. We used to use, some sp after I took the wig off, my hair had grown out, then we used some Nes Nestle streaks and tips. It was a black stuff that just stuck on the hair and, and it plumped the hair together and you didn't see the bald spot. So I used that all through the series. But originally they wanted that look, because my hair was so short and they wanted that beetles or monkeys, really monkeys look, that uh, they gave me th these wigs. And I must say, these little girls loved the wigs, you know. In fact, I think my demise, the, the character started, started to lose uh, his popularity, w w was three things. The hair wasn't real, and they found that out. I wasn't really Russian, and I was American, and that exotic flavor was gone. And that I was married, and that they couldn't fantasize about, uh, you know, being with Chekhov. So after that, you know, things sort of took a nosedive. Did you ever receive any reaction from the Russian community to the character of Chekhov? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. That wasn't being seen. This, it, was the, it was the era of the, uh, the, the Iron Curtain. It wasn't being seen in, seen in, in, in the Soviet Union. Um, now, I, w I was told, and I don't know if it was told as an ego stroke uh, to me, but Leonard and Bill, went to the, uh, to the screening of Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. It was held in, in Russia, and, you know, and, at, at their Academy of Arts, and uh, you know, for the elite of the cultural community, and that they loved the film, and they loved the character of Chekhov. Now, that's what I was told. It's all secondhand, but um, they felt a certain pride in the fact that we had in you know, incorporated uh, a Russian onto the ship, and he was treated, and he, that he was treated with respect and cared for, and, and that uh, he was an equal among uh, among equals. So that's the only thing I ever heard. I did get to, this is t a total aside. I did get to meet a couple of Russian astronauts, cosmonauts. I think it was in England, and uh, we took pictures together. And what I found curious was when we stood together. We were all the same size, because those ships you know, they used were tiny. They were really tiny, and uh, you couldn't get anybody bigger than 5'5 five, five or 5'6 five, in, into them.